Don't try to understand because you're not going to understand. It's the small steps that you take with getting to know yourself again, with building your life up again, with knowing who you are without your better half. What's up, YouTube fam? This is your girl, Lauren Denise, host of This Too Shall Suck podcast, A Fresh Perspective on Grief, back with another episode. So listen, this week we're going to be diving into the grief of losing a spouse. And I had to take a breath with that because my goodness. Um, and I'm going to be bringing on a close friend and colleague of mine, Bianca, who is going to be sharing her story on losing her spouse. She lost her husband at a young age. And so just being able to kind of give her the space to be vulnerable and talk about that and uh, having to kind of figure out who she was after losing him and not being his wife anymore, having to kind of understand that his family is not her people anymore, really having to figure out how to love again, how to date again, right? Um, and so it's it's a really, really good episode. We really dive into different feelings and emotions. So if you have lost a spouse or if you know someone who has lost a spouse, make sure you share this with them. As always, like I say, leave a comment. Let me know what part resonated. Welcome back, my loves, to another week's episode of This Two Shall Suck Podcast, A Fresh Perspective on grief. Thank you so much for being here. If this is your first time here, welcome, welcome, welcome to the grief community, to the tribe, to the squad, to the family. If you are back, back, what's the song? Tag team back. <laughs> You're probably like, is this a, is this a podcast about grief? Cause yeah, it is. It is. We're bringing that lighter perspective. Welcome back. So uh, on this episode, we're going to be diving into the grief of losing a spouse. So I have a close friend, a close associate who I work with, and we were having a conversation recently and she was telling me how she lost her husband and she's young. Um, we are, well, I'm 33 and uh, she was 20, I think four at the time that she lost her husband. Um, you know, it, it went fairly quickly. It just kind of came out of nowhere. Um, but once you listen to her story, you know, she kind of explains how it, it did come out of nowhere, but you know, there's reasons that she felt why it might have, um, happened in the way that it did. Right. And so, uh, she's just really vulnerable, really honest. And again, I thought it was important to bring on someone who lost a spouse, especially someone who was young, because you hear about all the time you know, older people who lose their spouses and things happen with that. But how do you deal with that when you're so young? How do you uh, survive that when this is the person who you are supposed to spend the rest of your life with? And it's like our life just began and then all of a sudden it just ended. And so there's a lot of different emotions and feelings that you can imagine that she has to process on a daily basis and that she had to really process, especially when her husband uh, first passed. And so I'm really excited to have Miss Bianca on and for her to share her story. But y'all know me. Y'all know I love to come with something, give y'all a little something, facts um, or something before we start the episode. So I found this article and y'all know I usually share the article with you, but I don't. I don't know if I fully agree with this article and I think it's older. So maybe that's why uh, this might've been, you know, post or post <laughs> pre COVID obviously. Um, but basically the title of the article says grief fades within six months for many widows. And I just don't, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that's accurate. I just don't, I don't believe it's accurate um, for a couple of different reasons is because I saw my dad, obviously, um, you know, grieve my mother for a long time. People who knew him, he started dating. I will say he started dating fairly quickly after my mom passed. And he told me that he was like, you know, I found this woman, I think we're going to date. And he was like, I know people are going to have something to say. And what I shared with him is like, how do I, or how do we, as anyone who has had a spouse, especially my parents, they were married 20, is it 25 or 26 years? 27 years, almost 30 years when my mom passed, how do I get to say to you when it's too soon? When you've had this person in your life for a long period of time, uh, basically a third of your life or half your life, why do I get to say, oh, it's too soon for you to date? I don't get to say that to you. Nobody gets to say that to you because I don't know what it feels like to lose a spouse. And also me and Bianca kind of spoke about it offline that we feel like sometimes with men, 
it is harder for them to kind of process because, you know, maybe their woman did a lot of things for them. And I know my mom did a lot for my dad. Um, I saw that just growing up. And then I saw that even when she passed and having to kind of step in and do some of those things. Right. Um, like I don't, I don't get to tell you when it's too soon. And so that's why like this article, it's like within six months, like people probably would have thought he wasn't grieving my mom because, um, you know, he started dating sooner, but he still struggled with, even within their dating relationship, just in general, like I saw the struggle. So I don't know, they didn't hit the mark on this one. But the reason that I really pulled up this article is because it talks about the amount of people that lose their spouses each year. I think it's specifically in the U.S. So in the U.S., more than 900,000 adults lose spouses each year. And then, of course, nearly 75% of them are over the age of eight, uh, six, not 85, 65. Um, it says the AARP, a group that represents Americans over the age of 50, says that there are more than 13.7 million widow people in the United States and more than 11 million or 80% are women. And so I, I feel like maybe that was like common knowledge that women typically outlive men, but Again, for my case, my mom, my dad outlived my mom, which we all were honestly like we all were like, that's weird. <laughs> like, because my dad was the barbecuingist, cigar smokingist, tequila drinkingist, hypest human being I met in my life. And my mom was just so even killed and sweet and ate salads and veggies. So we were very, very confused. Honestly, very my dad was even confused. Like we all were confused. Um and so I just kind of wanted, that's why I brought up this article is because I was looking for that. But then when I saw like after six months, like it fades, I'm like, I don't think it ever fades. That it, it almost brings me to the point of like, when people say you'll get over it, I feel like this is what this article is trying to say is that your grief will, you'll get over your grief. No, you never get over your grief. As I always say, you get through it and it's a lifelong journey. You just learn how to manage it and you learn how to adjust to it. So to say that like their grief fades within six months, I think is, is kind of a slap in the face to anyone who has lost a spouse to say like, okay, I've spent this amount of time with this person, whether it was a year, whether it was five years, whether it was 50, whether it was 25 to say that within six months, my grief fades. It just, I don't know. I'm going to have to write, you know what? I'm going to write a letter to them. Okay. Cause I think that's slick disrespectful to say that. Now, what, you know, you may be able to function better after the six months. Maybe that's the better verbiage is that after that six months, I'm able to move forward. I'm able to get out of bed. I'm able to do the things that I need to do and take those steps necessary in order for me to move forward. But to say that, like, it's going to fade within six months, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. And I might write a letter. Okay. <laughs> But anyways, I'll go down a rabbit hole on that. I just wanted to bring that up to just, uh, you know, talk about how crazy it is and how many people lose their spouses, obviously, in the older age. And so, again, that's why I wanted to bring Bianca on because uh, her and her husband were very young when he passed and she's still having to move forward, still having to just get up every day thinking about him and, you know, moving forward, even in dating and, and learning how to love again. Right. Um, so I'm really excited for you all to hear our conversation. I love Bianca. I really, really do, but you know how it goes. We're about to get to this break and then we will get right into it. Bianca Pearson is a family oriented and animal loving entrepreneur from Johannesburg, South Africa. Graduated at the age of 16, Bianca decided to teach for two years instead of studying and then had the opportunity to au pair in England for six months. Upon returning, she found herself in the graphic design and printing industry and then went into telemarketing and sales. While working in sales, Bianca found her love for admin organization, which she then knew it was what she wanted to do. In 2015, she started freelancing and in 2017, she became a full-time virtual assistant. Bianca not only works as a full-time operations manager virtual assistant, but she also teaches other South Africans how to start their very own virtual assistant business. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the wonderful Bianca. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lo. Hey, Thank you. Hey. Hey, girl. <laughs> so hey. I call her B. Y'all can't call her that, okay? So <laughs> y'all call her Bianca, okay? 
Only family calls her B, and we're family. Yes. I know y'all can't tell, but we're like cousins, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but B, thank you so much for being here. Um, it was crazy, you know. B and I literally were having a conversation, I think, last week, mm-hmm. and uh, she was asking me about the podcast, and she shared with me just her story and how she lost her husband. And uh, I thought it was really important to bring her on to talk about that, especially because, you know, just being younger and losing your spouse, I can only imagine. Um, But also we talked about, you know, dating afterwards and what that looks like, because I think a lot of people think there's no light at the end of the tunnel when that happens. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I knew Bianca was the person. I mean, she's my person. So I knew (laughs) she was the perfect person to bring on. So thank you, B, for being here. I appreciate you, girl. You're welcome. (laughs) You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Of course. Of course. So as y'all know, B is in South Africa, as I just said. So I don't, is it, it's afternoon there, right? Evening? Afternoon? It is. It's oh. afternoon. Afternoon. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Still morning here for me. So, you know, pulling it together here. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get into it, B. So um, if you just want to share a little bit about your story with your husband, Um, And then obviously we'll get into the whole thing. But, you know, for those who don't know of what happened with your husband, how old were you, all of that, so they can get a better understanding of the B that I know. Mm. So I'll start from the very beginning of how we actually met, as opposed to just diving into into the sad. But um, so when... When I eventually got into corporate and into sales, there was this man that just walked into the office the one day and he walked in with such pride that Mm. when I looked at him, I thought he was the CEO of the company. (laughs) Meanwhile, he was... He was the furthest thing from that. He was actually just, I can't even remember what position he had, but he was, um, I think he was just a sales rep that was on the road. He was the, the sales manager, but they did some restructuring and they asked if he wanted to go on the road and he opted for, for taking that position. And the minute I shook his hand when he introduced himself, I knew there was going to be trouble. I knew he wasn't going to leave me alone. And <laughs> there was, and it and it wasn't, it wasn't a feeling of like he's going to stalk me or this was going to become like an a harassment thing. It was just there was something there. And Literally within weeks of me working there, he started asking me out for dinner. And I was like, well, I can't go out for dinner with you. Um, I'm dating someone. He's like, but I'm asking you out for dinner. I'm not asking you and your boyfriend. So I was like, <laughs> that, that, that still is a hard no. Like I'm not one of those, I'm not one of those girls right. that are just like, yeah, I'll go. <laughs> And then he changed his game. He's like, well, what about lunch? I was like, it's the same thing. So, no. Right, right. And small things started happening and I started getting, like, becoming very unhappy in the relationship that I was in. And every time I got to work, he would just be there and he'd be, like, sort of giving me a shoulder to cry on and... He he was like my knight in shining armor, if I could put it that way. And the day that I ended up breaking up with the guy that I was in a relationship with, and I told my my late husband, I was like, listen, okay, this is the situation. I don't have any way to live. Like, do you maybe know somewhere I can crash for the evening just until you know I get um get everything I need? And he's like, well, come stay with me. I'll get a trailer organized. I'll make sure all your stuff is moved. Like, just just give me the go ahead and I'll organize it. So I was like, okay. And <laughs> that evening, literally, it, it was within hours. And he came and picked me up. And he brought one of his neighbors with him that helped me move a few of my things. And that was the beginning of, of our relationship. So... Wow. From the day that I met him until 
the day that I actually said, okay, we can go out for lunch was a total uh, was a total period of six months. So he oh, was wow. constantly asking. He was constantly like just being very nice and being open and just just being there. And that's why I say he was like my knight in shining armor because every time something went wrong and he could see I was teary-eyed at the office, he would pull me into the boardroom and he'll be like, okay, Bianca, what's going on? What's going on? And I could see it was coming from a sincere place. And it wasn't, again, it wasn't anything like harassment or him just being a male wanting to get into my pants or anything like that. It was, it was sincere. And this was back in... 2013 so I was 21 at the time I just turned 21 and he helped me organize my 21st birthday he made sure my family was there he was just all about making me happy and he's like if you ever want to go to your family take my car go if you ever want your family to come over invite them over he wasn't so the relationship that I was in before that, it was completely the opposite. I felt mm. boxed in. I felt like I couldn't see my family. And changing from that into the relationship that I then had with him, it it was completely different. And that feeling that I had of the day that when I met him, I think that was the moment I knew this was the man I'm going to marry. And mm. I, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to put it in words. It was just this, this emotion. And even though I fought against it every day for six months, it just, it, it, it eventually happened. And, um, <laughs> And I'm glad it happened. I'm I'm glad it happened. Um, fast forward a couple of uh, years after that, we got married in 2016, um, in July 2016. And if we didn't get married that year, I don't think it would have happened. So mm. the reason why I say that is the following year, 2017, his... She wasn't a, a blood relative, but he grew up with her and she was like an aunt figure to him. She was then diagnosed with cancer. I think she had stomach cancer, if I'm not mistaken. And it just, it happened very quickly. So we found out around Easter 2017 and in September, she deteriorated so quickly that I think she was in hospital for a few weeks and then she was just gone. And he was, she, she, and, and she was like a second mom to him, so much so that he actually called the hospital and told them, listen, if anything happens to her, you phone me. You don't phone mm. her sister. You don't phone any other family members. You phone me. And I still remember the morning that, that she passed and he never heard his phone ringing. I heard it and I picked up the phone and I could immediately hear something was wrong. So when he phoned the hospital back and he heard the news, he, it's like something just changed in him. And since that day, like everything changed and I'm not I'm not saying in a sense of like just my life because it impacted so many other people's lives, but mm -hmm. it's, and, and, and I'll explain why I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up. So she passed in, in September, 2017. Then in 2018, he, his name's Marcus, by the way. Um, Marcus then started getting very bad hip pain. And he was 30. He was seven years older than me. He was 31 at the time. And he went to um, he went to the doctor and 
they did all sorts of blood tests and all that kind of stuff, but they couldn't find anything wrong. So they said he needs to go to a specialist and mm -hmm. they then opted to do a scope on his hip to see what the issue could be instead of just doing like a hip replacement because of his age they wanted to take all the precautions necessary before they actually do the surgery so in September of 2018 he went and he had the 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 camera scope done and he was in hospital for three days wasn't very long he was discharged took him home he had to walk on a crutch because they were they were playing around with his bones and all that kind of stuff yeah. and the results yeah. that came back was early arthritis and very very bad gout so it almost looked like it was bone on bone like there was no mm. more cartilage in between the bone and that's what was causing the pain so the doctors said okay well we're going to provide all this medication let's see if that works before we actually do the surgery so we're like okay cool we'll we'll trust the doctors you know we'll we'll go with what they say and I think it was the, the second or third day after his op and he was lying in bed and I was getting to work, uh, working from home so I could still look after him. And I could remember that he was struggling to breathe. Like he wasn't, he wasn't breathing from his chest anymore. He was breathing through his stomach. Mm. And I was like, okay, well, you don't sound very good. You're drenched in sweat. You're not moving from bed. Like, let's just take you to, to the doctor and see what's going on. So we took him to the doctor and she said it sounded like he had pneumonia. And she she wanted him to go back to hospital. But if anyone knew the type of man that he was and how stubborn he is, he turned around to the doctor and said, no, I just came out of hospital. I don't want to go back. Please let me go home. Sounds like most and men, girl. Most of them. <laughs> exactly. So so I was like, okay, well, um, I can't force this man to, to go to hospital. So if he says he's okay, he wants to go home, then okay. And she's like, okay, but before I let you go home, this is the medication you need to take. And she looked at me. She's like, Bianca, if he doesn't feel better within 24 hours, take him to casualty, which is like the ER in South Africa. So I was like, okay, okay this is a bit frightening, but okay. And she also made him sign a waiver saying that he won't hold her liable for anything. Now, when I think back onto all these things that happened, I was like, I should have put my foot, like, I should have put my foot down. I should have told him, no, go to hospital. Don't go home, go to hospital. But we'll get that, we'll get to there in a sec. And we then went home, still wasn't feeling good. He didn't eat, so he couldn't take the medication the doctor prescribed. And then a couple of hours later, they were, he, he looked worse. I was like, no, 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 no. So I rushed him to, to hospital. And as soon as we got to hospital, they helped him in immediately. They brought him a wheelchair. They then took him um, into the ER. They did all sorts of blood tests. They gave him oxygen because he was struggling to breathe. And at this time, I was panicking. I was really, really panicking. I was like, I'm alone. I was... 24 I was like mm. I don't know what to do so I phoned his brother because his brother has a bit of uh, medical background and I was like can you please just come through I don't know what's going on the doctors aren't explaining like in proper English like normal people language like right, what's going right. on so when his brother eventually arrived they they then eventually came to speak to us and they're like, okay, well, we need to take him to ICU. His organs are going into failure. It's not getting oxygen that it needs. It's It doesn't look good. Then that same night, they had to put him on a ventilator. They had to put him in an induced coma. Um, and it, it just literally went downhill from there. The... He he ended up being in ICU for a total period of 
think it was five weeks. And he eventually came out of sedation because it looked like he was getting better. But as soon as he started getting better, something else went wrong. So they then had to put him back and under sedation. And it was like a give and take, a give and take, like the whole time. And I never left that hospital. I worked there in between visiting hours. I'd go and sit at the cafeteria and I'll just go and work. As soon as it was visiting hours, I would be there. I would like... I started making friends with the other people that was visiting their family members because we were all there for so long. And it just, it it became a part of my life for those five weeks and I didn't Mm -hmm. sleep. I didn't, I didn't want to go home. I didn't want to eat. It just, and and I actually, it actually got to such, it's to, to such a point where I told my family, please don't phone me. Because if my mm. phone rings, I'm going to be expecting the worst. So just rather send me a, a text or something, but just don't phone me. And there were various doctors involved. He had multiple surgeries because of the stress that his body was under with the various medications and machines and all sorts of things that that uh, were hooked to him. The The biggest operation that he had was they had to remove a piece of his right lung because of how badly infected it was. Like if you think of it, you can live without a kidney or a piece of your liver. Like you would never think you can live without a section of your lung. Right. But but apparently it's possible. (laughs) It's possible. (laughs) Who knew? knew? It's possible. So that, that um, surgery took, I think it was about 10 hours and oh my gosh the biggest fear i had that day was like we all know how medical dramas work the doctor walks out of the operating theater mm-hmm. and they're like well we're so sorry but we couldn't do anything to save them that was my biggest fear that day but he made it through he made it through he had multiple drains coming out because of all the liquid and all that stuff. And we thought he was going to be doing better. Fast forward, I think it was about a week and a few days. And the one morning, uh, the mor- well, the morning of October 29th, I let the dogs out of the house because they, sl- they sleep with me every night. I let them out of the house and... I thought to myself, okay, well, it's not time to get up just yet. Let me see if I can get a little bit of more, a little bit more sleep before I have to get up. So I went back to bed and I had a dream. I had a very strange dream. I had a dream where Marcus was leaving the hospital, but he wasn't driving his car. He was in the passenger seat of his car and somebody else was driving. And I was in my own car behind him. And I just kept calling out to him. I was like, you can't leave. You can't leave. You're not well. You need to come back. You need to come back. And he turned around and he said, I'm fine. My throat is sore, but I'm fine. And the more I thought of that dream when I woke up, the person who was driving the car was his aunt that passed away the year before. Mm -mm. So so Mm -mm. to me it 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 felt like it 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 honestly felt either like a message from God or it felt like his way of saying goodbye because he never spoke for those five weeks that he was in hospital. The time that he was not under sedation, like he could communicate with his eyes his hands were tied to the bed because he had the ventilator in and Mm. he kept pulling it out so they had to tie his hands to the bed and that was his way of saying goodbye but now bear in mind this was the morning of so when I got to the hospital I was already in a very weird 
like my mind was just in a weird space because I didn't know what to make of this dream. But I mm. didn't realize it was his aunt until the end of the day. So there were various people that came and visited him during the day. And that evening, I just had a feeling that I shouldn't go home. I shouldn't go home. And I actually asked the the nurses in the ICU, I was like, do you guys mind if I just stay a little bit longer tonight? And they said, it's fine, you can stay. And I think they got used to me being there, that they didn't chase me away. So I was like, okay, right. they, they're just being nice. They know me but, now. <laughs> But I, I also get, get a feeling that they see it so often that they sort of know when the person's not going to come back. Mm. So I stayed extra after visiting hours and his doctor then phoned the ICU and she spoke to me and she's like, Bianca, just be prepared. Things aren't looking good. So I was like, okay, well, how can you be prepared? You know, like... Right you've been with this person every day for five weeks, you've seen the ups and downs, you thought they're getting better and you learn all this medical jargon and you yourself can actually like sort of see the, or sort of know what to expect, but you still don't know how to prepare yourself. So the ICU uh, staff members asked me, okay, Bianca, is there anyone we can call for you? So I was like, just phone his brother and tell him to come through. His brother rushed through. He had one look at him and he's like, I'm going to go fetch our mom. So he left the hospital. His uh, brother's partner came through and he stayed with me while he went to go fetch his mom. And the drive from the hospital to where his mom lived was about 45 minutes. So it was 45 minutes there, 45 minutes back. And that time period was like the longest time in my life. It just felt like it was standing still. I was like, his family needs to get here. His family needs to get here. I could see that the nurses were getting anxious that like I could tell something was, was going to happen, but you still don't know. Like, you know, but you don't know. Right. And literally his mom and his brother walked into the ICU and he flatlined. Everybody dropped what they were doing. At, I don't even know how many nurses there were, but they rushed into his room and they, I don't know what you want to call it, they revived him. Um. So we're like, okay, he's going to be okay. That This is like the worst he's been. And we were all standing by the nurse's station right outside his room. And I think it was a total of five of us. It was me, his mom, his brother, his brother's partner, and a family friend. And while we were standing there, I felt this calm presence just wash over me, like, it's going to be okay. It doesn't matter what's going on, but it's going to be okay. And minutes later, he flatlined again. And again, everyone rushed in. And there was so much happening, but it didn't feel like there was enough happening. And Two of the, the ICU doctors then came out of his room and they looked at us and they just said, we're sorry. I'm like, you sorry what? And they didn't say, we're sorry, he's dead. They just said, we're sorry. And I'm like, can I go see him? Like, like I didn't know. I didn't know. When we walked back into his room, it, it looked like he was sleeping. It looked like how he looked from the time that we walked in there. The only difference was his chest wasn't moving. That was the only difference. He was still warm. He he did lose a little bit of weight because he wasn't doing anything for five weeks and he was being fed through a tube. But And he had grown a bit of a beard. But he looked like he was sleeping. He looked peaceful and 
minutes later, my sister came in and I was just in a state of shock. Um, I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know how to react. I think it was about a half an hour later, my mom and my stepdad came and from that time to, I don't even know for how long after that, I was just in such a state of shock that I was like, I've been with this man for five years. Every single day of my life was just this man, this man. And he was my best friend. And then he was gone. And everything else around me kept going but me. And then I thought back like on that dream that I had in the beginning in the beginning of the day, in the morning. I was like, now it made sense. He was saying goodbye to me. That mm -hmm. calm feeling I had when we were standing outside his ICU room, that was God giving me a hug, saying, It's okay. His aunt came to fetch him. He he longed for his aunt so much that I personally feel it made him sick, like he had a bit of broken heart syndrome. And every year since his aunt passed away, I've lost somebody every single year. So it was his aunt in 2017. It was Marcus in 2018. 2019, it was a neighbor that became a very, very close friend. In 2020, a very, very good friend of mine left for the UK and he hasn't been back because of COVID. Then this year in April, Marcus's dog died. So it's like every year since 2017, somebody has left me and if if a person hasn't gone through loss themselves they won't know what it feels like mm -hmm. because I've dealt with colleagues and co-workers that have lost people and I was like oh I'm so sorry you know but you kind of need to come back to work and I didn't realize exactly how much emotion it takes out of a person when you mm. lose someone because I didn't go through it. And the whole healing process of me losing Marcus, I was, I was a completely different person, completely different person. I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to stay at home. I just wanted to cry. I didn't want to speak to anyone. And I threw myself into work. I was working every single day because the more the more I could concentrate on something else meant I didn't have to think about what I was actually dealing with because you don't mm. know how to deal with it. You don't mm -hmm. know you don't know how to cope with those emotions. And my mom actually referred me to a Christian counselor. So this lady was the first person that I actually spoke to about what I was dealing with. And she, she kind of opened up that pathway of me talking about it versus me just, just holding it in. And mm -hmm. I think... The more I would hold it in, I think I actually got angry. And, and my sister and I actually spoke about this yesterday. And I was like, I don't think I went through the anger stage. But I actually think I did. But I didn't like mm -hmm. lash out like what you would think that anger stage right. would be like. I think I was, was a different kind of angry. And it after I spoke to this this Christian counselor, I then went to go see a Christian psychologist and I saw her every single week for the period of a year. And sometimes she would just let me sit and cry with her. Sometimes she would just sit and pray with me. Sometimes she would let me sit and imagine what life would still be like if Marcus was here. And mm. she, one of the 
they, they were two very big things that, that I took away with seeing her. The first thing was I need to learn who I am as a single person, not being Marcus's wife anymore. Mm. Then the, sec- the second thing she told me was, you will always be a part of Marcus's family, but they're not your people anymore. Mm. You were tied to his family through him, but he's not here anymore. So you have to find your own people. And I think because I came out of a bad relationship straight into being with Marcus, I didn't find me. And because I was also still very young, I didn't know who I was as a person. So it was yeah. all this, this emotion, this, this confusion, this not knowing, this lack of understanding, the lack of not having a purpose, all of this kind of stuff that I, I, like, I didn't want to live, but I didn't want to give up. Mm. So it was, a, it was a constant battle. And even though I did end up speaking about my emotions and trying to deal with it, it some people, it, it just didn't make sense to some people. And people started telling me that I need to start dating again. I need to start, like, getting out there. I'm like, how? How yeah. can you expect me to just let go of this person I was with for five years, even though five years is not a long, like it's not a long time, but that's all I knew. Yeah. But that was your husband. It was five years and five minutes. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. I was like, I can't, I can't just let go. I know the Bible says till death do us part. And then you don't have that bond anymore, but you still need to go through that process. And Because of how society is, people, and and I know, Elo, this is one of the reasons why you started this podcast is because people don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really have anyone close to me to speak to about what I was dealing with. And you just, you just think that, there's so many, like your your perspective just changes. There's so many people that go through the same thing, but you don't know about it. And it's like what, what I said to you the other day was you'd go to the shops and you would see a teller and they will help you and they'll pack your groceries and all that. But you don't know what their story is. You don't know what they're suffering. You don't know if they just went through a loss. And if someone's mean to them just for the sake of being mean that just might be the last straw and Mm -hmm. my whole perspective just changed about how to treat people and again if I didn't go through what I went through with losing Marcus I don't think I would have looked at life the same way and even if I look back at all the things that have happened and all the things I say to myself, like I should have forced him go, to go to the hospital, I should have done this. But again, that wasn't my decision. So yeah. whether or not I forced him to go to hospital, who knew he might have ended up in a freak accident. His mm. time was his time. And I'm just glad that I could have spent those five weeks with him every step of the way being with him at that very last moment because I knew if the roles were reversed he wouldn't have let go he would have done exactly the same thing and I think that's what it means when when you say your vows and you say for better or worse through sickness and health and all those cliche things you you there and even even his his uh, doctor that looked after him at the hospital she's like I've never seen a wife that would sit with her husband every single visiting hour and I was like mm. well I don't want to go home I'd rather be here and know right. what's going on yeah so it's it's 
it's just been it's been an insane journey it's not something that I wish on anyone to go through and I know people have worse stories and they go through things differently but just the just the idea of losing a spouse and you know people will say like I don't know how you do it you just do it you just yeah. have to wake up you just have to get dressed you just have to force yourself to eat you just you just have to go through the emotions and again if you don't go through it yourself you're not going to know and mm. during yeah. during my time of of seeing the the Christian um, psychologist, she asked me, she's like, Bianca, do you think you'd ever want to date again? And I was like, well, funnily enough, Marcus's mom wants me to because she doesn't want me to be alone. And I was like, I know she means it out, the goodness out of her heart, and she's being sincere about it. But I was like, I wasn't ready. I just wasn't ready. But she she like just kept nudging me. She's like, So Bianca, are you gonna go out? Are you like gonna spend time with your friends? I'm like, no, I'm just gonna sit at home and work, <laughs> nope. you know. I'm okay. Nope. Thanks. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 the, the the psychologist would also ask me every now and then, she's like, Bianca, if you feel you're ready, just go and see, like just find out if you're okay with it. And I think it was in it was December 2019, if I remember correctly. And I was like, okay, well, I don't really have that many friends, you know, and I don't really, really want to go out. So I'm going to try the Tinder thing and just see how I feel. Not, I'm not mm -hmm. doing it for the sake of wanting to find anything in particular. I just want to know if I'm ready, how I'm going to feel with talking to someone else. Mm -hmm. and now, B, before we get into your dating story, I want to put a pin in that because I had a question uh -huh. for you off of something that you said that I think is really important mm -hmm. for people who do lose a spouse. I think what you said was you didn't know who you were outside of being Marcus's outside. wife. So I can imagine mm -hmm. someone who's lost a spouse, they don't know who they are outside of being this person's spouse. How did you go about kind of finding out who Bianca, and I know obviously you were younger, but how did you go about finding out who Bianca Pearson was outside of being Marcus's wife? Because again, somebody listening is like, I don't know who I am outside of being this person's spouse. How am I supposed to do that? Mm. Um, I still don't actually think I've got the answer to that. Mm. And the reason why I say that is because me personally, I've changed according to like people that I live with versus certain things that I go through. So it's, it's very difficult, but I think the core, like your core stays the same. So and 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 I asked myself this question. I was like, okay, well, I know my favorite color is blue. So I know I like blue. I know I like to run. So I know that. But like, does that make me understand who I am? I was like, that I don't think mm. that that makes sense. So I had a lot of conversations with myself about actually knowing who I am. So what I mean by me changing according to who I live with. So for example, my sister and I live together and she moved in with me after Marcus passed away. And a lot of people would be like, well, how does it living with your sister? I'm like, fine. Like she does her thing. I do my thing. It's, it's just different, like living with a sibling versus living with your husband because with yeah. me I would have rather spoken to Marcus about anything and everything because he was my best friend because he was my spouse versus my sister as an example because it still feels like oh there needs to be secrets between us and there's sibling rivalry and things like that yeah and yeah. And that would sort of like just change me a little bit. So I would still be more competitive with her versus how I was with Marcus. But I think 
I think each person goes on a lifelong journey with finding out who they are. I don't think it's something that you find in a year or 10 years, 15 years. I think it's a lifelong journey and things change. I might have liked something five years ago when I met Marcus where now I'm like, I don't like it anymore. And a prime Mm. example of that is he loved spicy food and I couldn't stomach spicy food. (laughs) Right. But after, but after he passed away, I'd be like, that Tabasco reminds me of him. So I'll have a bit of mm. Tabasco. Oh, so okay. then my brain, so my brain just started like putting the two together. I'm like, okay, if I have that, it will remind me of the nights that we would eat out. It would remind mm. me of the food that he used to cook. So again, things would just change and it's it's a lifelong journey. It's not it's not something that that you just figure out like that. Yeah, it really you just kind of in, in my figure opinion. it out. As you, yeah, mm. I mean, I get it though, because like you said, and and I was thinking, it, I don't, I don't, I think about like numbers and stuff like that. But you said y'all were together for five years, and then you're with him for mm-hmm. five weeks. I don't know if you even made the correlation there, but I immediately thought of that when you when Mm-mm. you said that. I don't know what the number five means. Somebody tell me. Somebody, somebody slide my DMs and tell me because I know somebody knows. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I was like five years, five weeks. What is it? What's the number five? You know, so that is interesting. The, the, there's another thing about a number in his story. So his birthday is the first of November, mm-hmm. and the day that he passed away is the 29th of October. So it was two days before his 33rd birthday. And 33 is what they call the Jesus year. Yeah. Because that's the year was, that Jesus. Yes. So for me, that just the, the, the year 33 was like, okay, okay, that, that I can get. That that makes sense to me. So it's it's like all these things that just and I don't know if it's your subconscious as well that just like plays on your emotions and what you're going through, but there's certain things that just make sense, like the dream, for example, like that that embrace that I felt. And there, there were a lot of times like that that I had, or there were a lot of times during my, my grieving process that I felt things like that. I was hiking with friends um when was it it was it it was in 2019 April and we went on a hike and it was rainy and it was misty and it was cold and there was a wind that just came from behind and it felt like a hug it didn't feel Mm. like okay my hair is being blown kind of a thing it felt like a hug so I was like okay I haven't felt something like that before so it's not just the wind blowing. There were the one day when I walked out of the house, right next to Marcus's car, there was a pile of ants in a heart shape just before Valentine's wow. Day. Oh, like cut a, it out. Like a perf- <laughs> it was a perfect heart shape. And th- there were so many things. Before my sister and I moved to the same town where his mom was because I wanted to move closer to her just so that we could be together during this time there was an angel in the form of clouds over the place that we decided to rent um there's there was so many things low it's it's like it just felt it it didn't feel like I was alone Mm. and I know a lot of people, and I know you've mentioned this as well, that it feels, it sometimes feels like that person is still there or they, mm-hmm. they're in the wind or they, they're smiling down at you. And I think it just comes in different forms for every person. And before a few of these things happen, I still remember telling my sister, I was like, I just want to see him. I just want to see him in a dream. I just want to feel his presence. And she's like, don't think about it. The moment you don't think about it is the moment that something will happen. 
And mm. I was like, well, it's it's kind of hard not thinking about it because right. that's all that's on your mind. <laughs> right, right. But but I but I think like the the less you you try to actually get something, I think that's when eventually like the spirit will speak to you. Not not Mark's spirit, like the Holy Spirit would, yeah, would right, speak right. to you through through different forms of like you okay. You're going yeah. through this terrible, terrible thing in your life, but you are okay. And yeah. I think that's that's something that a lot of people don't feel is they don't mm-hmm. feel okay. And that's the only thing you do want to feel. You want to feel okay. You want to you want to know that when I wake up the next morning that I'm going to be okay. And that was that was something that I struggled with for a very very long time because how are you going to feel okay? How are you going to wake up and be like I have to go through this all over again? And it's those little steps that you take. It's the little steps of, okay, today I'm going to get dressed. Today I'm going to make myself a cup of coffee and I'm going to enjoy whatever program. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to enjoy the birds chirping outside. It's it's the little things that remind you the world is still moving. Yours is still standing still but everybody else's world is still moving. And that was a big thing to to understand because, like, my mom had to go back to school. My sister had to go back to school. They, they're both mm. teachers. So, and everybody else just had to carry on moving. And I'm like, but how? How? I can't. Mm. I can't. Mm-hmm. And eventually you just – some people – get get to this mindset a lot quicker than others but eventually you just start eventually you start being okay whether it's a year two years 10 years 20 years eventually you start being okay and it's a process it is it is because me and you had that conversation I was telling you the day that my mom passed I literally Mm. looked out the window and saw the clouds moving really slow and I noticed in that moment, like, oh, the world's lit- the world literally is still moving, even though I feel like I'm suffocating. And mm. I, even when she passed that night, that was something that I kept with me of like, just look up in the sky, you know, and it, look up could mean so many different things, right? Look up to God and all that. But like, look up in the sky, watch those clouds literally slowly moving, like the world hasn't stopped turning, even though you feel like yours did. And so I think that's important. Like you said, it's taking those little steps, whether it's, okay, I put one foot out the bed today. Cool. All right. Tomorrow I'm going to put two feet out the bed. Great. I'm going to get up and I'm going to stand up. I'm going to put the TV, but you know, like it, like give yourself more credit for those little steps that you're taking because those little steps are going to lead to that, that healing, even though grief is a Mm -hmm. lifelong journey, like at least getting past that heavy part of it, that, that healing that you need, you know what I mean? So I think Mm. that's really important that you said that, you know, so I didn't want to pass over that because that is really important that even you feel like I can't move, I can't breathe, I can't do Mm. anything, but people are moving, you know, you start getting mad at people. Well, I did start Mm. getting mad at people because they have the audacity to go to work and, you know, do all Mm -hmm. these things. And it's like, yeah, Lauren, like, yes, I understand, but like, you got to keep moving. So. Uh, mm. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on that because that's that's really important. So now we can get into this dating because <laughs> I did want to talk about, I wanted to talk about it. I don't know if it's necessarily anything that we need to like really dive into, but like your therapist talking about his family is kind of no longer your family. And I think that mm-hmm. is interesting, you know, because again, this the, it's like, yes, I was connected through him, but like, this is my family. So it's like, you know, but obviously you and his mom are, you know, still connected. She was encouraging you to date. So um, when you heard that at first, so yeah, we are going to dive into it. So when you heard that at first, (laughs) (laughs) how did that, I can imagine how that made you feel. Cause it's like, so am I going to like lose contact with the family? If I start dating again, am I not going to talk? Like, I can only imagine how that felt, 
you know, being a widow and, and hearing like, yeah, you were only connected through this person, which is the truth. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. again, I just, mm-mm. I feel like that's a whole nother grief in itself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, th- I think my story is, is maybe a little bit different. Um, it's not just black and white in the sense of, okay, he's not my family anymore. So there were a few things leading up to, to the psychologist saying that. So for his mom's birthday, the it was the 2019 birthday, we all went away on, I think it was in a small little town, and we just went for a weekend away. And that whole time that I was there, I felt, I felt alone. Mm. Even though I was around people that I knew, even though I was around people that were grieving the same that I was going through, they, it, it, to me, it felt like they've moved on and I was sitting there stuck. Mm. And it felt like I was still grieving, but they were okay. So after that holiday, when I went to go see my psychologist and I was like, listen, this is what happened. This is how I felt. And is it wrong of me to feel less connected to them now that he's not around? And she then told me, she's like, Bianca, they're not your people anymore. And that's why you're feeling that way. Because every time you would go and see them, Marcus was with you. Every time you guys had a gathering together, he was with you. And mm. you would only see them when you were with him. So now when you're with him, he's not there. So you do feel alone. You do feel like you're not connected anymore. So when she explained it like that to me, I was like, okay, that makes sense. I understand what you're saying. And yes, it doesn't feel like we're connected anymore because that connection isn't there. Yes, Mm -hmm. we do still speak, but we don't speak as often as what we would if would if he was still here. And that's why I'm saying it wasn't just black and white where like one of us cuts each other off, but it, it, it's this whole thing of they grieved differently because yes, it was a child that his mom lost. It was a sibling that his brother lost, but it's not a spouse and it's different. I know with you losing your parents, it's different versus if they had to lose you or your sister so Mm -hmm. it's a different grieving process like even the the day after he passed we all met at his brother's apartment and they were smiling and laughing and making breakfast and my sister had to force me to eat I was like how how can you guys be okay I'm angry at you for wanting to smile for wanting to laugh it's not okay like Mm -hmm. I, I, I sat there I was like I was in this different like it it was just different and I think it was because I was once still in shock too because I was with him for five years whereas they only saw him every now and then And I felt that again when we were on this holiday together. I was like, there's there's not that that family bond anymore because he was the bond. And I think it also upset me in a sense of the type of person that he was, that if anyone else in his family passed away, he would have still held them all together together. And I didn't feel like I got that from them. Mm. So when my psychologist said they're not your people, I was like, okay, I I get it. I understand. And yeah. thank you for letting me see that and not making me feel judged for feeling that way. Yeah. And I think I think that's 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 one of the many things that you go through in the grieving process. You you feel like you're judged. 
You judged yep. because you're still grieving. Mm-hmm. You judged because you still cry when you tell stories. And there's, it's just different. It's like him and his mom and I would just, just after he passed, he, we would share stories about his childhood, about what he was like when he was a child. And it made her sad, but it made me smile. So it's, it's different. It's just different for everyone. Yeah. So No, that's good, B. That's good. That's really good. The way that you broke that down, that makes sense. I mean, it makes sense, you know, because I, I obviously, you know, again, I not having a spouse and not losing a spouse. Initially, I'm like, dang, they aren't your people anymore. You know, I think of it from a literal sense, but like your psychologist mm-hmm. is saying is like, you feel alone because it's like, how dare y'all have the audacity to be over here drinking mimosas and having a good time when this man just passed away yesterday? Like, you know, now that I get, mm-hmm. that I understand. But, <laughs> you know, outside of that, it, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. It's like, I I thought that, you know, you were going to maybe be on the same trajectory as I am. And that's just not the case. It'll never be the case. And that's mm-hmm. okay, too. You know, so I love that. I do love that. So we can get into this dating. Get into it, B. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into so, it. So you got on the Tinder. Mm-hmm. You weren't looking for anything. Felt- However. <laughs> no. No. But before we get to that piece, the first time I went on Tinder, I felt I felt sick to my stomach. Mm. And when I had that feeling, I knew that I wasn't ready. Yeah. So I then deleted the app. I was like, I'm, I'm never going to find love again. I'm never going to love anyone again. I'm never going to get married again. I'm just, mm. just going to be a widow forever. And continued to see, to see my psychologist and continued with work, continued with grieving and crying and just trying to put one foot in front of the other. And eventually in February of the next year, 2020, (laughs) um, I decided, okay, well, let me try this again and let's see if anything's changed. You know, it's also after the festive season. Maybe that's also one of the reasons why I felt like I wasn't ready because everybody's happy. Everybody's in such good spirits. and here I am having Christmas with my husband's ashes. (laughs) Um, And I was like, I can't be happy. I can't be happy. And I was like, okay, well, let me, let me try this again. So it, it was early February. I think it was the first or the second of Feb and a guy and I matched on Tinder and he said hi first. And usually, like, the, the vibes that I would get with Tinder is, like, you'd match, but nobody wants to say hello first. Like, you match and that's it. That's it. But he but he said hi first. And he was like, well, let's talk on WhatsApp. You know, like, I don't like the Tinder thing. I don't want to constantly be on the app. I was like, this is a bit, like, very forward. But, okay, I'll give you my number. We'll. We'll chat on WhatsApp. If if I think you, I'm, I'm getting stalker vibes from you, I'll just block you, you know, maybe get a new cell phone number. <laughs> and we ended up talking, I think it was until 2, 3 o'clock the next morning. There were no, there were no weird vibes. There were no sexual comments. There were, it was just genuine conversation. And I explained to him about what happened and he explained to me that his mom went through something similar of losing her husband so he can sort of understand what I was going through. So that didn't scare him off, which I was glad about because if if it did, then like, you know, that's just going to end it there. And yeah. And he told me that he just moved to Joburg. Uh, he also came from a little farming town in South Africa. 
and he literally just moved there that day, which is why Tinder could pick up our locations. So I was like, okay, cool. And I asked him, I was like, well, you know, I work from home. If you're free the next day, if you want to, we could meet up. And he's like, yeah, I'm not starting work yet, so we can meet up. So I was like, okay, let's go to a coffee shop where it's in public. You're not coming to my house. I'm not coming to your place. Let's just in case, just in case. <laughs> and strangely enough, I didn't feel nervous. Strangely enough, I didn't feel stick, sick to my stomach. I didn't, I felt okay. I felt I was able to put one foot in front of the next and I could give it a try and see how it goes. And if I didn't like this guy, I could just turn around and go home. Right. nothing about it so I was like okay so we met we met at a coffee shop and I think we sat there for three to four hours just talking wow. and it's such a small world that the town that he comes from I've got family in that town so I was like okay and he ended up knowing my family members so I was like okay very, very small world. And he, with him just moving to, to Joburg, he's like, well, will you mind me? Will you mind helping me to, to go pick out a few things for my apartment? I was like, this is weird, but okay, sure, no problem. And he's asking me for opinions on furniture to buy and just a few household items. I was like, no, don't buy this, rather buy that brand. And it it felt like, like I was a wife because that's what I knew and that's what I was comfortable with. And I think because I could immediately share that, that, weird intimacy without actually being intimate I think it's an emotional intimacy and with him being okay with it I think I think it just it just fits and we've been inseparable since then because lockdown happened <laughs> lockdown happened because COVID. <laughs> COVID. Co COVID has either made or broken relationships, in my opinion. That, that's for real. You either having babies or getting divorced or loving them or hating mm -hmm. them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> and it's it just happened, and I think it was the right time to have happened. And we waited quite a while before telling anyone um, because I asked um, and I, I sort of pushed him to like ask me out because we were seeing each other, but he didn't like say the words. And then when we eventually made it public, everybody was so happy. They were so, so happy for me. And I was like, wow, I thought I was going to be judged. I thought people were going to be like, it's too soon. But people were telling me to start dating. So, like, I was expecting the worst of people. But meanwhile, they were just wanting me to be okay. They were wanting me to just be happy. And and it's people that I haven't even met. It's people that saw my posts on Instagram about what I was going through. And now when I post something about me and Chris, then they're like, Bianca, I remember. I remember the posts that you were posting two, three years ago. I remember what you said. And I'm so happy you found someone. So just to tie it all together, I sometimes don't know if I had to go through what I went through to be in the space where I am now. But in the same breath, it's like, but why did Marcus have to die for, that to for me to be in this relationship. So that is something mm. that I'm struggling with now because I don't understand that. 
And it's like, well, if I didn't meet Marcus, I wouldn't have done X, Y, Z. I wouldn't have been where I am now. But why did he have to die? So that's my next journey that I have to personally go through because that's something I don't understand. And I might just be looking at it the wrong way, but at this moment, that's what I feel like. And I've even, I've, I've spoken to Chris about it as well. And he's like, well, he shouldn't have died for you to be where you are. I'm like, I know it it just doesn't feel right. But, but somehow, somehow it's just worked out. And the time that Marcus and I have been together, there's a lot of things that he had to work through in a sense of his relationship with God, because he always told me that he always looked up to me. Excuse the pun, because I'm very short and he was very tall. <laughs> he he would say that he would always look up to me because of how I lived my life and because how he would see me pray and he would see me praise and worship and he would then start doing it. He's like, I pray for you. I was like, I was like, I've never seen you pray. <laughs> so like, what did you say? How'd that go? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that's what I'm saying. It's like, I don't know if in a way I led him to God without realizing it. And God then knew, okay, he was ready to leave this earth. And mm. he knew that I would find Chris and Chris would then be my next spouse or my next soulmate or I don't know. And that I would be okay again. So it's, it, it's weird. It's just so weird how things work. And like, if I think back on everything that's happened, it's, it's only God that, could have paved the way to have worked out the way that it did. Yes, I was very sad. Yes, I went through a terrible time. Yes, I was constantly crying, constantly crying. But it was good that came out of it as well. And I think when... And, and like you say, grieving is a lifelong process. It's not that I'm over it. I've just learned how to deal with it. I still get sad. October is a terrible month for me. Terrible, terrible month for me. And I think the biggest thing is if you make peace with it yourself. Knowing that I'm going to wake up and I'm not going to see Marcus. Knowing that I'm going to wake up and my life isn't like that anymore. But life does carry on unfortunately those that have left and this is what a lot of people have told me those that have left this earth are the ones that are okay it's the people that are left behind on this earth that aren't okay and we need to learn how to be okay with those that aren't here anymore it's us that suffer and sometimes People just don't know how to be okay. And I think that's that's the biggest thing that people struggle with. And it's like I said before as well, you don't know how to be okay. But if you make peace with it, I think that's like one of the first steps that you can take is just to be okay with being okay. There was, there was a very long time that um, there was a very long – time during I think the first year of losing Marcus where I was like I don't want to smile I don't want to smile if someone's going to ask me how are you doing I'm not going to say I'm good because I'm not good I'm just say I'll just say I'm well thank you I'm doing okay thank you I'm not necessarily going to open up and cry in front of you but I'm not going to say I'm good I'm not going to smile I'm not going to laugh because I don't want to because it feels wrong and when his mom would laugh or when his brother would laugh, then 
I didn't understand that. I still don't understand that. But it's people grieve differently. And my sister, she she was very sweet. She she went with me on all these, like when we had to sort out his his um his funeral arrangements and all those kind of things. She's like, I'm going to come with you because I know you're not in the right frame of mind to make decisions and I don't want them to bully you. So I'm going to go with you. And if you're not happy, just tap my leg and I'll say something. And I was like, but this is his family. How can I fight against his family? I'm one person. Meanwhile, it's his mom and his brother. She's like, I don't care. You were married to him. You're his family. (laughs) Exactly. And I think having people that will take those steps with you makes such a big difference. It really does. Because if, if I think if my sister wasn't with me in a lot of those things, I think a lot of stuff would have turned out differently compared to how they did. And it's it's a journey. It's a journey. Mm. But I'm going to ask it anyway, because maybe you got <laughs> some more jewels. Because, <laughs> I mean, every, I, I think just sharing your story, um, just the vulnerability that you've shared this whole time is going to help someone in general. But I always like to ask people, my last question is, if someone's listening to this who um, has lost a spouse or unfortunately may lose a spouse in the future, what are some takeaways or a takeaway or takeaways you want them to have when listening to this episode so they can know that they're able to move forward in life without their spouse? I would say the biggest thing is don't try to understand what's going on because you're not going to understand. I still don't understand. And it's the small steps that you take with getting to know yourself again, with building your life up again, with knowing who you are without your better half. It's learning how to look people in the eye again without bursting into tears. It's learning how to be happy for someone else while you dying inside. It's it's learning how to love. And it doesn't happen overnight. I still reread some of my diary entries of the raw emotions I felt when Marcus just passed away, especially the first week. And I think it was the third day where I wrote, it was actually an okay day without you. And this was like the third, fourth day after he passed away. And when I reread that, I'm like, what was going through my mind when I re- when when I wrote that? Because maybe at that in in those ten minutes I felt okay, but then as you read through the rest of the entry, it's like I wasn't okay, and it's going to come in waves. It's going to be I'm okay for five minutes, and then something happens. A bird will fly past you for goodness sake, and you'll burst into tears. And you can't control it. And it's just being okay with the fact of grieving. Just being okay with the fact of your person isn't there anymore. Whether or not they're with God in heaven, we won't know. We will only eventually find out when we're there but we hope for the best. And that was also one of the biggest things that I was worried about. But with everything that God showed me, the dream, the the presence in the, in the hospital and the ICU, 
there's no way that Marcus wouldn't be with God. And I think that's secretively a very big fear everybody has in not knowing if you're going to see your loved one again. And we can't force someone to do something that we believe in. So I just always hoped, I was like, I hope he's in heaven. I hope he's in heaven. I hope he's in heaven. But with everything that the Holy Spirit showed me, I'm like, okay, you're showing me he's in heaven. I can be okay because I know where I'm going and Marcus is okay. He doesn't have hip pain anymore. His throat isn't sore anymore. His lungs are whole. I'm not okay. He's okay. And with me knowing that he's okay, I'm okay. So I know it, it was a very long explanation. No, but... that was perfection. That was perfect. <laughs> that was perfect, B. He's okay. I'm not okay, but he's okay. I think that's that's what we all have to realize is, like you said, we're not okay, but like my parents are okay. Marcus is okay. Anyone who you lose is okay. We're the ones struggling. They're no longer mm -hmm. struggling. So, mm -hmm. uh, B, you really just warm my heart. <laughs> my heart is warm right now. It really is. Seriously. Just thank you for being here. And like I said, just being vulnerable and being honest about your story. I think it's going to just touch so many people, especially because, you know, we're, we're in this millennial realm and, you know, obviously you hear about people losing their spouse when they're older, but when you're younger, like, what do you do with that? Um, and so thank you, girl, for just being here. So if someone wants to reach out to you to learn more about the beautiful bee or, you know, just to share, you know, to say like, hey, thank you for helping me. How can they reach you? How can they contact you? So the best would be via Instagram. My handle is Bianca dot, I don't know, dot Pearson um, or full stop Pearson. <laughs> Whichever, how, how, however you guys want to say it, but in South Africa, we'll say Bianca dot Pearson. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, so we so country in the U.S. We like Bianca, just country. It's like, y'all don't say it like just country, just country. Well, thank you again, B, for being here. Thank you for being honest and vulnerable. You know, you You're know, welcome. right here, right here in my heart. That's where you stay, B. <laughs> Thank you. B, I just love her. I just love her. Um, I think I just appreciate a lot about her just being vulnerable. And I'm sure if you're listening or if you're watching on YouTube, you probably could see me tearing up. You probably saw her tearing up um, because it's just something... Like she was young when he, I mean, she's still young, obviously, but like, that's not something that you should have to endure at that young of an age. And, you know, for that to be her knight in shining armor and that knight to be taken from her, you know, I just can't imagine, you know, I can't imagine obviously, but like, I, I, you know, I hate that she had to go through that. And I, that question, like she said, that she's currently kind of struggling with is why did he have to be taken from me in order for these things to happen? And I think that happens a lot of times in grief, right? Is that we get to a point and we're like, why did this have to happen for that to have to happen? Like, why did, why was the, why was this the cause and effect? Do you know what I mean? Like, why, why did this have to trigger that like cool yeah I'm in a great place yeah these opportunities are coming but like why you know I think about that all the time honestly you know I tell people with this podcast like it's great and I'm honored and grateful that I'm able to help people heal in their grieving journey but literally I'll go to God sometimes and say God why you have the audacity for me to stand up here and help people in their grief when I am grieving the loss of my parents, you didn't have to take my parents. Like we, I could have talked about grief from a whole nother perspective, but like, why, why? And, um, I think that was really honest and vulnerable for her to say that. Cause I, 
can imagine if you're listening and you uh, have lost a spouse and you're thinking about that to say like, okay, I've met this great person who I'm now dating, or, you know, my kids are good, or this is what's come from that. I've started a nonprofit for them to bring awareness or insert whatever said good thing is. And to be like, God, why, why, why did that have to happen for this to happen? Could we have not started a nonprofit another way? Could my kids not have been good another way? Could I have, you know, that could have been somebody else's husband in, in another lifetime? Like why? Um, and I think, uh, like she said, what's really important is to just know you're never going to understand. And I think that's just grief as a whole. You're just never going to, you're never going to understand it, you know? And I had to come to that realization myself is like, I don't understand why God took these two amazing people from my life. Like I can think of so many bad people in my life who probably could have gone and not even in like a, uh, a, a cynical way to say like, oh, this person shouldn't know. But like, there's bad people out there. And and let me not say bad, because bad is relative, right? But there's, my parents were good people. They were genuinely good people. They loved hard. They gave, um, they looked out for everybody. They made sure we never, and when I say we, my siblings never wanted for anything. They were genuinely good human beings. And then I see some people and I'm like, yeah, I think fundamentally, maybe there's something there that's, you're not maybe the best person you could be at your core. And, you know, for these two fundamentally good human beings to be taken is really interesting. And it's something that I had to come to realization, just like B said, you're never going to understand it. Um, and so I think that's just really important is just knowing, like to be gentle with yourself, to know that, you know what, like, I'm never going to understand why this person was taken from me. I'm never going to understand why I have to live every day without this person. I don't understand why um, good things are happening, but these good things, do they have to, like, did this have to happen for these good things to happen? Like, it's just really important to know that you're probably never going to understand. I don't think any of us are ever going to understand in this grieving journey, right? I think that's why it's a really special community to be in. And I'm not even saying that in like a join the club, like, you know, because at the end of the day, we're all grieving something. But I think that's the important thing is we, sometimes we're just never going to understand why we are grieving the thing that we love the most or we needed the most or um, we desired the most or we we just we just don't understand. We just don't understand. But, you know, as I always say, as you're going through the journey of knowing that you're going to be OK you know, um, you may not be okay right now, but you're going to be okay. And just know that, um, you know, you're going to be okay. I think that's, that's the biggest thing is that you may not be okay right now and you probably won't be okay for a long time. And that's also okay, but you're going to be okay. So as I always say, as you're going through the journey of trying to be just okay, not great, just okay. Be kind to yourself and give yourself grace because if you don't, who will? <laughs> That's it, you guys. Thank you so, so much again for listening to another week's episode of this Two Shall Suck podcast, a fresh perspective on grief. If you are not already, follow me on social media at this Two Shall Suck podcast. I love talking to you guys. I love when y'all slide in the DMs. I love it. I love it. I love engaging with you guys. So please follow me on social media at this Two Shall Suck podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And if you don't have social media, because we know like it was, it's been going crazy lately. You can definitely email me at hello at this two shell suck podcast.com. Let me know how this episode resonated with you. Or if you want any topics, you can definitely send them there as well. This episode and all the episodes that you hear are produced by my amazing producer, Mike Sick. And all the original music you hear is also produced by my amazing producer, Jimmy Samaj. Listen, you know, I love you guys so much and I'm sending you love and light in your life because you deserve it. All right, my loves, I hope you all enjoyed that episode. You can actually listen to this Two Shall Suck podcast, a fresh perspective on grief on all listening platforms. And make sure if you're not already following me on social media, on Instagram and on Facebook at this Two Shall Suck podcast. And you can hit my website as well. Learn more about your girl, Lauren Denise at www.thistwoshallsuckpodcast.com. If you love this episode, if it resonated with you, make sure you hit that like button, let me know, because I know I need to make more videos like that. 
for you and meet me in the comments. Let's talk about it. I love, love, love talking to y'all and make sure you definitely hit that little, that little bell, that little subscribe button. Thank you guys as always, and I'll see you on the next episode.